You're listening to an Ono Media Podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Into the Dark Podcast with me, Peyton Moreland. I am so excited you are here. If you are watching on YouTube, can you please just very, very quickly give me a thumbs up and leave a comment below during the video? It helps with the algorithm and I could really use the help. And if you are listening on audio and can leave me a review, that would be great. I'm sorry to keep begging you every week, but it's quite literally my job. So thank you for sticking with me through it. And I love you guys so, so much. If you are new here, hi, this is Into the Dark Podcast. I have another podcast called Murder With My Husband. It's a true crime podcast with my husband. And this is kind of the spinoff of that. And it's my solo show. So hi, we cover all things dark. We cover murder. We cover hauntings. We cover ghost stories. And then also last week, we did a case that was about a subject that I realized is not supposed to be covered on this specific platform where viewers watch. It kind of rhymes with mamiracy (laughs) peeries. And so I need to come up with a different word to say because I don't want the video to be... um, restricted anymore so when we are talking about those certain things we are now going to be calling them tin foil tells um so if i ever say tin foil tells you know that that means we're covering a monmiracy puri okay i hope that you guys are following along i hate that we have these guidelines but i get that they're here for a reason so last week we covered one of those and it was really great everyone seemed to love it and this week we are covering a murder. So stay tuned. All right. Now, before we jump into the episode, um, we always do something called 10 seconds. It's just a way to start the episode off on a lighter foot before jumping into the darker stuff. So this week for my 10 seconds, I'm going to be talking about how Garrett, my husband, surprised me by taking me to the Olivia Rodrigo concert this last week. It was amazing. It was so good. I screamed every single word. I actually went to her sour tour. This was her guts tour. And she has just grown even so much since then. Her confidence on stage, her vocals, like everything is just even better than the first time. And so I was really just proud of her. I had such a fun night. And yeah, I hope that all of you guys have a fun week as well. Okay, with that being said, we are going to jump in. And this episode includes discussions of murder and cannibalism. So please listen with care. Now, There's a debate that's been raging in the true crime community for years now. It's about finding the line between raising awareness and exploitation. Because after all, we are telling real people's stories here. A lot of times we are describing the worst thing that has ever happened to someone. And it can't be fun to see your lived experience become entertainment for someone else. On the one hand, this kind of work really does do a lot of good. There are a lot of real world examples where true crime media has brought attention to an unsolved case and even helped the police bring the culprit to justice. And even when you don't get such concrete results, some survivors just appreciate the opportunity to get their story out there and feel seen and feel like they're making a difference. But at the same time, we're also giving attention to the killers, making them, you know, a little infamous, which can be harmful. So where's the line where the bad aspects of true crime outweigh the good? I don't know if we'll ever find the exact right balance in every case or if there is even such a thing, but I will say one thing. Killers should not benefit from their crimes. They certainly shouldn't become rich at their victim's expense. That seems fairly uncontroversial, right? But in today's story, the murderer went on to become a celebrity, almost like he was rewarded for what he did. But the killer I'm discussing couldn't have been more anonymous one evening in mid-June back in 1981. It was that time of year when the days feel like they last forever. The sky was still bright with sunlight, even though it was after 8 p.m., And we are in Paris, the city that never sleeps. It was clogged with pedestrians. They were on their way to dinner or running errands after work. And all in the middle of this, in Paris in 1981, there's a Japanese man carrying two suitcases who's hailing for a cab. And he's 32 years old. 
And the cab driver that pulled over for him didn't know it, but the man was actually a student at the Sorbonne. The cab driver, though, did notice how heavy the bags were this man was carrying when he loaded them into his taxi for him. He even made a joke. He said, what have you got in here, a body? And the student explained that, no, these bags are just full of books, which obviously made sense. He probably did a lot of studying. So after the student gets in the cab, together they drove to the Bois de Boulogne Park, which wasn't all that far away, but I guess the student didn't want to walk with those heavy bags. Now this park is this massive, beautiful green space in Western Paris. It looks like something out of a painting, just grass and trees and a gorgeous lake. So the student gets out of the cab and he's walking down a pathway and some kind of fluid begins dripping out of his suitcases. And we know this because several passersby notice and wondered what he had in there. Like it's obvious people are seeing that his suitcase is dripping fluid. Some even went so far to call the police and report what they'd seen. But before the authorities could arrive, the man set his bags down turned and then walked away without them which obviously i'm not gonna lie that's pretty suspicious but nobody stopped him maybe they were afraid to confront him or they figured they'd already done their part by just reporting their suspicions well later that evening a couple of joggers passed the bags during their workout and the suitcases caught their attention particularly because like i said they were still leaking an unidentified fluid so these joggers paused to open the suitcases up And inside, they found a dismembered body. Now, the good news is the police investigation actually goes really quickly in this case. So many people had seen the Japanese student walking through the park with the dripping suitcases. They had a very detailed description thanks to all the reports, and it didn't take long for police to find the taxi driver who gave him a ride to the park. Presumably, he was able to identify the exact address where he had picked up the Japanese man. And honestly, in no time at all, the detectives found this guy in his apartment. So this Japanese man was named Issei Sagawa. And very soon after the incident in the park, they arrested Issei in his home. And he didn't resist. He went along with the officers willingly. They searched his apartment when they apprehended him, and they found more body parts that belonged to the person in the suitcase. They were stored in Issei's refrigerator. They also found an ID card that wasn't Issei's and turns out it belonged to the victim. Her name was Renee Hartfelt and she was also a student at the same school Issei attended. Once the police had him in custody, there was one big question they wanted him to answer. Why did he kill her? I mean, this case is very open and shut. Like they quickly found him. They find more of her body parts there, her ID card there. They know who the victim is. They know who the killer is. But why? Like, how does this all come to be? This is just such a very eerie and strange story that unfolded rather quickly. Now, Issei was all too happy to talk about himself. He gave a full confession and also even explained his motives. He told detectives that he was raised by a loving family in Kobe, Japan. Issei was sick and frail as a child because he was born prematurely. It was actually something of a miracle that he survived it all. So as he grew up, his parents absolutely doted on him. They showed him all the love and support they could. They were also quite wealthy, so Issei never had to want for anything. He tells police that sometimes while growing up, his uncle would come over and Issei, his brother, his father, and his uncle had this one particular game they played all the time. His uncle would pretend to be an evil man-eating giant and his father would be the knight who would protect his sons from this giant and they'd mock fight. And when his father won, Issei and his brother were saved, but sometimes his uncle would be the victor. And when he did that, he'd turn on the stove and set a pot on the burner, pretending that he was going to cook and eat his nephews. Now, Issei and his brother would laugh and squeal. They knew they weren't in any real danger and they loved the game. They loved pretending that this giant might eat them. Now, I think we all have childhood memories, something like this, but Issei responded in an unusual way growing up to these games he kind of became obsessed with the idea of being eaten and with eating other 
people. Eventually, he felt the need to consume human flesh for himself. Now, I'm not saying Issei's uncle turned him into a cannibal, but to hear Issei tell it, he was fascinated with eating human flesh from a pretty young age. He loved stories like Hansel and Gretel, specifically the parts where the evil witch wanted to cook the children. And according to Issei, he first realized he had similar impulses when he was just six years old. He actually told reporters with Vice that he was in first grade when he began thinking of his classmates in terms of how they might taste. This is a lot, but he goes on to say there was one boy in particular who Issei couldn't stop thinking about eating. And those feelings didn't go away as he got older. If anything, they intensified and they also took on a sexual component. Cannibalism and sexual desire were one and the same, at least in Issei's mind. So in that same interview, Issei told a story about how he saw a beautiful woman on the street one day and all he could think about was consuming her. By this point, Issei was a grown adult with the means to act on his desires. So he began stalking this girl. He learned where she lived and he broke into her apartment one night. When Issei snuck into her home, she woke up and she screamed. The police arrived before he had a chance to hurt her or to flee. He didn't tell the authorities his real intentions that night, so they charged him with attempted rape instead of attempted cannibalism. They never suspected anything about the cannibalism or even the murder. So technically, Issei lucked out. And as I said before, his father was wealthy and apparently willing to bail him out. So Issei's dad actually paid off the would-be victim in this case, and she agreed to drop any charges against him. So Issei's criminal record was clean, even after this incident. So that being said, it didn't stop him from being accepted into school in 1977. There, he majored in comparative literature and language. By this point, Issei was 20 years old, and the thought of eating human flesh wasn't just an obsession anymore. It was kind of his purpose in life. Or as he put it, quote, my desire to eat a woman had changed into an obligation. So Issei made a plan. He'd invite a sex worker to his apartment, then shoot and kill her. That way he could eat his victim without ever needing to leave his own home. There was no risk of waking his victim or making her scream like the last time he'd tried this. So every single night, he'd hire a sex worker. He'd take her back to his place, then wait until she was distracted, washing up in the bathroom. He'd lift the gun and aim it at the unsuspecting woman's back, but then he'd set it back down again. He just couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. It was one thing to fantasize about murder and cannibalism. It was something else entirely to take a person's life for real. It seemed to Issei like he'd never be able to make his dreams come true. But that all changed when he met Renee Hartsfeld. Like Issei, Renee was a student, like I said, and she was international. Originally, Renee was from Holland. The first time Issei met the 25-year-old Renee, the main thing he noticed was how beautiful her smile was. He couldn't take his eyes off her, and Issei didn't want to creep Renee out, so he quickly drew a sketch of her. So if she caught him staring, he could explain that he was just an artist just creating something beautiful in a moment of inspiration. Now, once they started talking, he found her to be open and approachable. It was actually easy for him to befriend her. He knew exactly how to put her at ease. And occasionally, Issei had small get-togethers in his apartment. Remember, they're all in college, and he invited Renee to one, and he was thrilled when she showed up. Other times, he just had her over for dinner alone. She seemed to enjoy spending time with him. And before long, meals at Issei's place kind of became the normal for these two. They were definitely friends. She wouldn't think anything of it if he asked her to come by. Issei told Renee that he wanted to learn German, and she offered to help tutor him. They began to meet even more regularly. Based on the letters Renee wrote home, it seems like she just saw Issei as a new friend, someone who was nice enough, but not like someone she wanted to date. But for his part, Issei couldn't get Renee out of his mind. In a word, Issei was becoming obsessed, and it wasn't good enough anymore for him to try to fulfill his desires with a sex worker. If Issei was ever going to taste human flesh, he didn't want it to be a stranger. He wanted... He maybe even thought that he needed to kill and consume his good friend, Renee. So one night, he invited her over again. 
And while Rene was looking away, Issei got out his gun, just like he had done several times with sex workers, and aimed it at her. He resolved not to lose his nerve this time, the same way he had so many times before. Then Issei pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't go off. It had misfired, almost like fate was intervening to spare Renee's life. So somehow after the misfire, Issei managed to put the gun away without her seeing. And after this, Renee just went home and she had no idea how close she'd come to losing her life that night which means she had no reason to feel suspicious when Issei said he needed her to come over again the very next evening. He claimed it was because he needed help with an assignment for a German language class. Issei said his professor wanted a recording of someone reading German poetry out loud, and he thought Renee was just the person to recite the poems. For the record, no such assignment existed, but Renee didn't know that. Once again, she came over to his place. Now it was June 11th, 1981, and the night played out very differently than the one before. Renee sat down next to a tape recorder. She picked up the book and started reading aloud in German. Yet again, she was too focused on what she was doing to pay much attention to Issei. She didn't see him walk to the cabinet where he kept his weapon. She didn't see him as he set aside his nerves and pointed the barrel at her back. And this time, when he pulled the trigger, the gun fired. The bullet tore through Renee's neck and she did die almost immediately. It was a clean kill shot. Issei's first thought was that maybe he should call an ambulance. That was his knee jerk response to seeing his friend get shot by himself. But he reminded himself that he didn't want to save Renee. He'd been preparing for and fantasizing about this moment for decades. He wanted to seize the opportunity for himself. So he butchered and ate her body. Now, Issei has given a lot of interviews about that night and he's described the exact things he did to Renee's corpse in detail. I'm obviously not going to repeat all of that here. It's very gruesome and not necessary to the story. But even though he'd been picturing this day for years, Issei was surprised at how conflicted he felt. It seems even after everything he'd done, Issei still valued Renee as a friend. He didn't like to think he'd never hang out with her again. After all, Issei didn't necessarily want Renee to be dead. He just wished there was a way that he could somehow cannibalize her while still letting her live. Now, I'm not reporting this so that you can feel bad for Issei or even sense a piece of humanity in him. I'm reporting this because it goes to the psychology of the killer. So many times we see this in true crime cases. We want to figure out why they did what they did. What were they thinking during this? And he's told us. It could be true, it could not be true. Later, he even told reporters that he'd have spared her life if she just offered some of her flesh to him that night. And I can't imagine how that would work exactly. It sounds to me like he's just trying to defect blame. He wanted to make it seem like Renee was at fault for her own murder because she wouldn't cater to his violent desires. But I do know Issei ate what he could. There were a lot of parts of her body that he couldn't handle. Some of her flesh was just too tough to cut through or had more fat and bone than meat. There were also body parts that he was afraid to butcher. And later Issei said in an interview that he was scared of blood. So he avoided some areas on the left side of her body. They were just too close to her heart, which I find wild. He'd be so squeamish about blood after everything else he did to her. For two or three days, Issei kept Renee's corpse in his apartment. It's very Jeffrey Dahmer. He was figuring out what was and wasn't edible. He was living out his fantasy. But by the time a few days had gone by, he knew he couldn't keep her remains forever. He had to dispose of those parts he couldn't consume. He set aside the pieces that he wanted to save, refrigerating them. Everything else he crammed into those two suitcases. He'd bought them recently, specifically for this purpose. This was all premeditated. And then he held that cab never imagining his poorly thought out plan to dump the body would very quickly get him arrested. He also probably never imagined how badly the French police would mishandle his case. 
I mean, come on, they had all the evidence they needed. Issei had freely confessed to everything. After they apprehended him, he waited for two years before his trial date. But just before the hearing could begin, the courts determined that Issei wasn't mentally competent to stand trial, so he couldn't actually be charged with murder. And I should note, according to the U.S. Sun, they came to this ruling right after Issei's wealthy father helped him hire a very high-powered lawyer. The implication being that once again, Issei's rich family connections helped him get out of legal trouble. So instead of taking Issei to trial, the officials resolved to have him committed to a mental health facility. So he'd still be off the streets in a position where he couldn't hurt anyone, even if he wasn't in prison. The arrangement was supposed to last for the rest of his life. But because Issei wasn't a French citizen, they decided to deport him back to Japan. That way, French taxpayers wouldn't be funding his treatment and his home country could just deal with him. And here's where they made their big mistake. So by the time Issei arrived back in Japan, there were no criminal charges against him. France had dropped the murder case when they decided not to go to trial. But because of the way information is shared in these kinds of circumstances, his Japanese psychologists couldn't look at all of his records from France. So it's almost like, he gets deported back to Japan and they don't really know what happened over in France. So they couldn't review all the disturbing things he said about why and how he had killed Renee. And when they did their own examinations with him, Issei didn't say anything bad enough to warrant an involuntary commitment. Basically, the Japanese criminal justice system's hands were tied. They knew that Issei was a killer and a cannibal. I mean, the story had been all over the news, but legally they were only able to consider certain information when deciding what to do with him. He didn't seem to be criminally insane and he was no longer being charged with murder in France. They had no legal reason to keep him confined. So you're going to literally not believe this, but they just let him go. On August 12th, 1986, he was officially a free man. He voluntarily checked himself out of the Japanese hospital where he was examined. To hear him tell it, the doctors may have even asked him to leave, like they didn't want to deal with him. All in all, Issei spent four years in a psychiatric hold in France. And by the time he got to Japan, the authorities had already decided to set him free. His stint in the French hospital wasn't long enough for him to receive any meaningful treatment for what seemed to be very severe mental health problems. And he never spent any time in an actual prison for Renee's murder. He never even had to defend himself in court. Now, if you think that's outrageous, be prepared to get even angrier because it's about to get much worse. Renee Hartvelt's murder was a huge news story. I mean, the crime was so graphic and disturbing. Of course, it's going to draw a lot of press attention. So now, Issei was a free man, walking the streets of Japan, able to do whatever he wanted. He was never charged. He could do interviews with journalists and appear on daytime talk shows. And that is exactly what he did. And he literally becomes kind of a massive celebrity. He wrote multiple books about Renee's murder that he committed, both texts and mangas with very explicit artwork. And as of 2021, he had 20 credits to his name. He wrote restaurant reviews and appeared in ads for different food products. And he starred in several documentaries about his crime. He even had a bit of a career in the softcore porn industry. Get this, making films specifically to appeal to people with a cannibalism fetish. In them, he'd reenact Renee's murder or pretend to eat his co-star. Even his family members benefited from his notoriety. Issei's brother published a memoir. One journalist in France also leaked the crime scene photos of Renee's body. This is a very massive invasion of her privacy and the reporter was arrested for the bad call. And this detail is so terrible. I feel so bad for Renee's family. Not only did they have to grapple with her murder and with how her killer went free, 
now her picture's being published like they were entertainment and her murderer is reenacting her murder on porn. It's hard to imagine how anyone could deal with all of this. Now, I also don't know exactly what was going on in Issei's mind through all of this. If he ever felt guilty that he was benefiting from Renee's murder, it does sound a bit like he played up his flesh eating killer persona. In one interview with a reporter with The Guardian, he offered her dishes from his cupboard while she was having lunch. He joked about the possibility that he might have used those same dishes to eat a person once. He also hinted that he wanted the reporter to give his flesh a try. And also during this report, he made a reference to another woman who'd recently gone missing, implying that me, he might have had something to do with it. Honestly, it's disgusting. It's kind of like he sees Renee's murder as some kind of joke. He's playing it up. He's trolling for attention. And it worked. Reporter after reporter wrote stories about his alarming statements. In one, he talked about how it was hard to resist temptation in the summer. Issei described how he'd check out these women on the street in their scanty clothes, and he'd fantasize about devouring them. So he clearly still has all of these desires. He'd also describe how he'd prepare the meat and announce that he needed to kill and eat at least one more woman before he died. Like he's saying this. Another time, a journalist asked Issei if he wanted to eat him. And Issei's answer was silent, but it still spoke volumes. He gazed at the reporter with a blank stare until he grew uncomfortable and moved on to the next question. But other times, he spoke about Renee's murder in negative terms. He described how the act of cannibalizing her didn't match his fantasy. He didn't come right out and say he was disappointed, but it did seem to be implied. And Issei even spoke regretfully about how he wished his friend was still alive. So did he really want to repeat the crime with another woman or was he just saying what he had to for the attention? Your guess is as good as mine. But there is one more story that I want to share about this. It might reveal something interesting about Issei's psychology. And this account comes from a documentary with Vice. On one occasion, Issei made an adult film with a woman named Yuri. I'm not sure if that's her real name or a pseudonym she used professionally, but when Yuri was first cast, she didn't know who Issei was. She'd never heard of him. And it wasn't even clear what sort of plot line their film would have. So while they were shooting the movie, Issei showed Yuri some news clippings between takes, and they included graphic crime scene photos of Renee, his victim. And he talked Yuri through the crime, explaining how and why he did it while he watched her squirm with discomfort. I mean, imagine you're filming with someone, an adult video nonetheless, and then you discover that he's a murderer who killed and ate somebody. And the more Yuri learned, the more emotional she became. And Issei kept pushing her, making creepy comments about the things he wanted to do to her too. By the time the shoot was over, Yuri seemed nervous and eager to leave. Afterward, she told an interviewer that she felt sorry for Issei on some level because she thought he was compensating for a deep insecurity, but she also was very much not okay with how he had acted. However, here's where things get weird. After their shoot, Yuri and Issei actually stayed in touch. According to him, they even became friends. They made social plans and went out together. But when Issei told the Vice reporters about their relationship, he also bragged about how he scared Yuri during their early meetings, which is a weird way to talk about a friend. It does sound like on some level, Issei couldn't resist the urge to frighten the young woman. Like his desire to control her emotional state was more important than her right to be comfortable. But it wasn't so severe that it stopped him from connecting with her. Almost like Yuri's initial impression was correct. Issei seemed to be at war with himself, split between his selfish desires to impose his will on vulnerable women and his longing for a real friend. So make of that what you will. In the final decade of his life, Issei stepped out of the limelight and lived a more private lifestyle. He had multiple strokes and eventually needed to use a wheelchair to get around. And because Issei required regular care, his brother stayed with him. Around this time, Issei began using a fake name so he could have some anonymity. When he died of a stroke in 2022, it did make international news. 
The whole world knew about the death of the so-called Kobe cannibal who passed at the ripe old age of 73, still a free man. His funeral was a private affair, close friends and family only, no press and no one from the general public. Until his dying day, Issei never expressed any remorse for what he did to Renee. Not in public, not in private. Renee's family said they never heard a word from him. There were no apologies or any communication. Now, if there's any silver lining to this story, it has to be that Issei never killed anyone else, at least not that we know of. After he got caught for Renee's murder, it seems like he restrained himself to his jokes, his interviews, his books, and his movies. So I think it's a good thing nobody else got hurt. But still, this whole story is such a massive miscarriage of justice. I feel bad for Renee's friends and family who lost her and then watched her killer basically rocket to stardom. And there is a lesson in here for all of us. It's one thing to find murder fascinating, but we should all make sure not to glorify it, especially when the victims are still, years later, waiting for justice. And that is our episode on Renee Hartvelt. Thank you so much for listening and watching, and I will see you next time as we dive further into the dark together. Goodbye. Goodbye.